Three weeks in October 2002, a time seared into our memories. But stepping over the line, shooting a kid. I guess it's getting to be really, really personal now. Absolute horror. This isn't supposed to happen in a community like this. As two murderous snipers encircled the Washington, D.C. area, a time when we all realized that our life or death in those 22 days was just a matter of chance. Welcome back to Three Weeks of Hell, the D.C. Snipers. I'm Bob Barnard. And I'm Melanie Alnwick. Now, where we left off, the second week of the sniper shootings had ended with the killing of 53-year-old Kenneth Bridges, murdered by one shot to the back as he pumped gas in Spotsylvania, Virginia. By then, thousands of calls were coming into the tip line, and the reward fund was growing. I reported from police headquarters nightly. Fox 5's team coverage continues now with Melanie Alnwick live in Rockville. Hi, Mel. Hi, Tracy. $237,000 and counting. The contributions to the reward fund are coming in from all over. A local law firm put up $3,500. A Springfield couple, $5,000. That's money put up in the hopes of bringing the shooter down. Angry words from Governor Paris Glenn Denning to the shooter who has so terrorized his state to stop uh, this insane killing. I think it's extremely important that they understand that no one is looking up to him, that uh, no one is thinking this is a great act that he's doing. Uh, we're all thinking that this is an act of absolute cowardice. You should understand that I hope to God that someday we'll know why all of this occurred. So did you hear what Montgomery County Police Chief Moose said there? He said, I hope to God. Now, as a reporter on the scene, you and I both know this, but maybe people don't really understand the insights as to why we choose certain p sound bites. That's it's right. Because they're powerful, right? Because they're going to be something that resonates with and people. And that one sounded like unusual to us. Yeah, really good and strong. So when Chief Moose said that, that was actually on October 8th, the night after Iron Brown was shot. What we in the media didn't know then is that those words were actually very carefully chosen by police. Why is that? Well, because at the scene of Iron's shooting outside Tasker Middle School in Bowie, Maryland, the day before, a tarot card was found. The first big clue in the case, the words, call me God, were written on top of that death card. Retired ATF Special Agent Mike Bouchard tells us now it was a coded response. Yeah, early on the first weekend, uh, we were doing our press conferences and you know we are getting um, we're trying to figure out what the motive is so during our press conferences we each had something um, different to say my thing was i don't know why in god's earth somebody would do something like this and we would just weave statements in like that and um, sure enough after um, iran brown was shot the tarot card said mr police call me god so then we knew we suspected they would probably be listening to press conferences then we knew they were listening to everything we said. Um, so that's where we knew that we have to communicate with these guys surreptitiously um, through our press conferences and try and draw them out and get them to engage with us. So before the rest of us knew that what you were saying was specific and targeted and, and thought out, you guys were, in a sense, using those open microphones and the TV cameras to kind of get your message to them. And what was that? What was the message? What were you trying to tell them? Talk to us. Um, what do you want? You know, why are you doing this? If you want money, tell us you want money. Um, if you've got a, a grudge with something, you know, tell us. Um, you know, we, we figured over time they would start communicating with us. And um, the more we talked through the media with them, um, the more engaged they came with their notes and um, eventually later on uh, phone calls, that type of thing. The reference to God, you said, why in God's name would do, was that deliberate? Did you? Yes. And what what made you think of that? That if I if I uh, use that kind of phrasing, that I might 
t trigger something within them. Yeah, it wasn't just my thought. We put our heads together, our public information officers. We had um, profilers. We had negotiators working with um, Chief Moose, myself, and Gary Ball, the FBI SAC. So um, they were giving us, and it was tough to deal with negotiators are telling you in one ear, say these things, draw them out, draw them out. The profilers are like, don't say anything, don't engage them, because you're going to make them more angry. Uh, you might make them do things that they n wouldn't normally do. So, it, you know, it was really different. You know, we had to make a decision, you know, two different schools of thought. But um, we just came up with some statements that Charles Moose and myself and others would say. The discovery of that tarot card did not remain secret for long. In fact, that very day, a police officer at the scene leaked an image of the card to a reporter, not one of ours. Then the news exploded. The people in my community have asked the police department to work the case. So I beg of the media, let us do our job. Yeah, it just you know really bothered us. Like, what do you? What's the motive here to leak this stuff? You trying to get a job, you know, with the media or looking for like, why would you do something like that? It's not going to help. The, it's going to hurt the case. It's not going to benefit you, the leaker. Um, and when you got hundreds of investigators, for one person who's not the decision maker to make decisions that impact the investigation. It could be a major mess if everybody felt that way. Yeah, like that tarot card got leaked within an hour or two. That's why Chief Moose got so emotional about um, one of the stations, I can't remember which one, um, covered the story. We got this tarot card with a picture of it. How the heck did they get that? Who was the guy who leaked the tarot card? Like, I don't need to know a name, but like, was it a... It was a police officer. A police officer? Mm -hmm. Yes. From Prince George's, because wasn't that Tasker mm -hmm. Middle School's mm -hmm. Prince George's? Yeah. So Prince George's kind of police officer, boom. Mm -hmm. wow. So again, I don't know why you would do that. Maybe you hope to get favorable coverage later on with the media. It's a hefty price to pay for a case like this when people are getting killed. Other evidence recovered at the Tasker Middle School scene, a blue ink pen, a bag of Dole Center raisins, and a 223 shell casing. We learned later that Muhammad's DNA was detected on that bag of raisins. And investigators also pondered the words, call me God, thinking it could be a reference to the 1990 movie Navy Seals, where an embattled soldier calls for God to help and a sniper responds, God here. Task force members even rented the movie for review. You can hear part of that movie clip on YouTube. God, God. God here. God, we got a single shooter, Southeast Tower. Yeah, I see him. Investigators and task force members were walking a wire. They had deeply disturbing information. Montgomery County Police Chief Charles Moose, tasked to be the public face of law enforcement, needed to convey the seriousness of the situation, yet still try to keep the public calm. As you heard Agent Bouchard say, they had a feeling that the snipers might be listening. And then the snipers proved them right. Here's Montgomery County State's Attorney John McCarthy. I remember at, at the press conference where the question was asked to Chief Moose, are, are, our, are, your, are our children safe? And, and uh, he indicated that your, your children were safe. He said that at the press conference to calm the fears of individuals. And, and the, in response to that comment, the Tesker Middle School shooting took place because they were, one of their goals was to maximize fear in the community. And if you were gonna say that some segment of the community was safe, they took action to make sure that you knew that was not true. Behind the scenes, the task force had grown to hundreds of federal agents and local police. Some were expert profilers, some were negotiators, and others were running down tips. Montgomery County State's Attorney John McCarthy, then the legal advisor to the task force, says a full investigative bureau sprang up in a Rockville office building away from the snooping media at police headquarters. What immediately happened uh, and, and a lot of credit belongs to the federal agencies. They mobilized all the inform all the, the the tables, the chairs, the computers, the phones that had been warehoused, so they could have an immediate response to a terrorism activity. That it, we commandeered basically a, an office building immediately behind the police station, literally behind it, went in and tore two floors of this building apart and set up the command center virtually overnight, so that when you walked in there, there were within 36 hours, there were hundreds of people 
working at this facility with computer and telephone hookups. And the room was set up in compartmentalized segments where that were the call takers in the front of the room when you first walked in. There were tables of people that would take tips that would come in randomly, both locally and internationally, uh, about who might be responsible for this. The next group of tables were people that were evaluators that would take the tips, take the information, and begin to do some kind of a, an analysis of what were the good tips and what were not, were not the good tips. And then they would then forward that to a third group who would then uh, take the best tips and begin to assign individuals, task force members, to maybe, if you were a suspect, you would then be trailed by somebody from the task force that would be watching you to determine whether or not you were the sniper or not. Uh, this went on for a number of days. Uh, on, on, on given days, we might be trailing with teams of federal and local officials, 16, 18 people on a given day. Uh, what generally ended the surveillance on those suspects would be another shooting. The snipers were also calling in. The case files show that sometime around October 12th, a subject claimed to have called the FBI task force number on four occasions over six days. Brass Hill City Police, love calls, the sign is reported. Good morning. Don't say anything, just listen. Where are the people that are causing the killing in your area? Here is one of those calls from teenage sniper Lee Boyd Malvo, clearly frustrated his previous attempts to reach investigators have gone nowhere. You'll hear him reference the tarot card left behind at the shooting of Iron Brown. Look on the tarot card. It says, call me God. Do not release the threat. We have called you three times before, trying to set up negotiations. We have gotten no response. People have died. Yes, sir. I need to get your information to Montgomery County Police Hotline. We're not investigating the crime. Do you like the number? Malvo hangs up, frustrated again. His calls likely lost in the sea of tips for white box truck sightings. Police released this composite drawing of the white box truck seen by witnesses at more than one of the shooting locations. In the beginning, we didn't think they were shooting from a car. Of course, early on, someone said they saw a white box truck uh, speeding from the scene. Again, there was no um, direct evidence that shots were taken from one, but someone saw it, and you know, we had to at least investigate that. But then groupthink took over with the public that that's all they should be think, uh, looking for. So uh, you could see all the tips that would come in after every shooting where the people would just say, um, I saw a white box truck. I didn't see anybody shooting from it, but it was driving away. So, you know, that didn't help us much. Did you know from your professional experience early on that that's not going to be probably what it is and it's going to get in the way of people maybe thinking more creatively of looking for something else? Yeah, early on, just by seeing the tips after each shooting where the people were saying that seemed to be the only thing they were focused on and the only thing they were looking for. So our media strategy changed where we started... Um, addressing the public through our press conferences about how they should focus on what their eyes and ears um, pick up, not what they think they should be looking for. Did that help? Did that persuade people? Not really. Um, we still <laughs> continue to get, I saw a white van, a white box truck. Okay, did you see anything else? Well, I wasn't looking for anything else. So um, we were kind of stuck with that. And as everyone now knows, that white box truck was a bad lead. Again, I asked state's attorney John McCarthy about this. So let's talk about the, uh, the white box truck. Mm. How did that happen? That was, uh, that was the lookout that came out of the Sarah Ramos killing. Uh, Ms. Ramos was uh, in Leisure World uh, in a strip shopping center, uh, sitting on a park bench, reading a book waiting for someone to pick her up to go clean a home. Uh, she was shot. At the time, we thought from a distance. In reality, we now know from a very close location. It was daylight when Ms. Ramos was shot. It was like 9.30 in the morning or something. And there was a lookout that came out that there was a white box truck that was seen going through the parking lot very close in time to her shooting. And it was broad daylight. That became the, the lookout Suspect vehicle, white box truck, leaving the scene of where Ms. Ramos is killed. That turned out to have nothing to do with it. Ironically, uh, 
Pascal Charlotte, 72, who was shot that same day, later, two blocks outside of Montgomery County on George Avenue, there is a report of a Chevy Caprice, dark colored vehicle, leaving the scene immediately after the shooting. So on that same day, which was be October 3rd, we had two different vehicles, two suspect vehicles, white box truck, Chevy Caprice. Uh, we seized on really following the lead on, on the box truck. That seemed to be, uh, and the, the, they were, there were sightings of the other car. And in hindsight, you know, there were multiple occasions uh, uh, I would say, I'm looking at, your uh, looking at the here. chart, one, two, three, four, five, there, there, were, there were 10 different occasions where ultimately in hindsight, the car was spotted in the vicinity of where the shootings took place. But after Ms. Ramos' shooting, the focus was on the white box truck and not the vehicle that had been seen coming from Mr. Charlotte's killing in the District of Columbia. Look, I'm not going to tell you it's the only time I've ever seen, look, you do law enforcement, you, you have leads, you have information. Uh, we, we seem to have, ex have seized upon the white box truck to the exclusion of the other. Mr. Charlotte's killing occurred at night. Uh, and one was broad daylight, one was at night. Was that the reason that one was given more value, rose to the top? But you didn't want to have a white box truck for the next three weeks and live in Washington, D.C. I mean, they literally, if you were somebody who was a commercial, you know, you were a carpenter, you were a car repair, you, you know, you were, whatever you did, you operated out of a white box truck, you got stopped 10, 15. It was hard for you to go around the corner in this community. Our Fox 5 news crews saw this happen time and again. And we literally were on Rockville Pike um, following a box truck and all of a sudden, you know, two, three Montgomery County officers would come in, lights and siren, uh, pull them over, we're behind them, you know, you know, obviously documenting all this and, and officers getting out with their long rifles, you know, walking up to the driver's side, the, the guys, driver gets out of the car, goes and opens up the, you know, his tailgate or his uh, box truck and they had to go through it. I mean, it was, it was a really intense time. That's Fox 5 News photographer Nelson Jones. He's worked at the station for 30 years. Says he was confronted by police himself one day during the killing spree, checking out a tip the snipers were seen at a golf course. Jones happened to be nearby and got there before the police. I just parked and got my camera out, and then we could hear the sirens. And it was every cop and detective that shows up, and of course I'm getting shots of them arriving to the golf course, which is, as you know, pretty rare. And, um, <clears throat> you know, the adrenaline with the officers, understandably, is high. And I just, uh, you know, had my camera and I was shooting them coming in. And this, this one SWAT guy or detective gets out with his long rifle and he, he walks right up to me and he puts it in my eyeballs and says, you know, what the F are you doing here? <laughs> and I basically didn't really respond because he probably kind of knew the answer to that question. But... I just kind of backed off and he went about his business and, you know, looking into the golf course. What'd you think of that? It's a rush, man. You know, uh, you never want to be looking down the, the barrel of, uh, of a gun. And then it turned out to be a false alarm that day. Of course, it was a false alarm. And yet if police had been looking for not a white box truck, but the dark colored Chevy Caprice, perhaps Muhammad and Malvo would have been caught a lot sooner. And that has to be so frustrating, not only for law enforcement, as we've heard them talk about, but can you imagine victims' families as well, thinking that perhaps it was there. They it could have, people could have been caught earlier. Yeah. And, and when you go back into the case files, as I did as we were preparing for this series, you really see that many, many people had encountered Muhammad and Malvo and that they were sketchy, they were suspicious. It was something that kind of went off in their brain about something's not right here. And then they all recalled these sightings to investigators, but only after the snipers had been caught. This is from those files. A man from a church in Clinton, Maryland reported, quote, numerous times over the last six weeks, a blue Chevy Caprice with tinted windows has been parked in his side lot next to the shed. He first spotted it prior to October 2nd. He saw it a second time in early October and again two weeks prior to October 28th. The vehicle would only be there for several hours during the middle of the day and would then disappear. The car also parked on the street. 
It continues, Muhammad's ex lives within one mile of this church. The week before this date, the source viewed Muhammad walking on Pineview Lane. We should tell you that Pineview Lane in Clinton, Maryland is about one block from where the first victim, Paul Arufa, was shot on September 5th. And there were more. A man reported later that while jogging, he'd seen John Muhammad in Clinton, Maryland the first week of October. Muhammad said he needed money and gave the man a phone number. A woman said she reported a blue caprice with yellow plates near the Safeway at the Laurel Shopping Center on October 5th. Another caller remembered being at the Milestone Shopping Center in Germantown and seeing an older model Chevy with New Jersey plates. In traffic, the caller looked over to see two black males who appeared homeless. He said both wore dark clothes and their hair was dirty. This was on October 14th, around one in the afternoon. Montgomery County State's Attorney John McCarthy called the Caprice a classic felony car. Was there a moment um, during when all of this was starting to come down when, in hindsight, putting the pieces together, just going, I can't believe it. Like with the Chevy, that damn Chevy Caprice. Well, uh, you go back to Mr. to Pascal's case. I mean, the fact that we became so fixated on the white box truck and there were so many sightings. Like, police officers will tell you, this is like what they call a felony car. It's you know, a beat up older model car. You know, it just looks like something, something's wrong about that. It's just, a felony car is just like a car that looks like it's up to no good. And this was like a felony car. It's a term of art that sometimes you use it. Uh, and this car was seen repeatedly. And it was actually stopped a couple of times. And they, but they stopped, they made identification, they owned the car, they had driver's licenses, no arrest warrants for anybody, they were let go. At one point, a police officer just north of Richmond spotted the Caprice. Like most others in law enforcement, Ashland, Virginia police officer Tim Meachin was on the lookout for the snipers, but didn't know for certain the kind of car they were driving. So, the Friday night, 18th, um, we were staying near Interstate 95 in town. Um, if we had a call to go anywhere else in town, we would go handle that call, but then we would come back to that 95 interchange, kind of making it a substation, if you will. Um, again, a, a visibility factor. Um, so right there at the interchange, there's a truck stop and there were a couple of hotels. So, I was just making loops in and around the truck stop and around the hotels. So I'm pull up in one of the hotel parking lots and there's a dark blue older model Chevrolet Caprice that's backed into a spot. So I, as I'm passing by, I can, I can see the rear of the car. And I saw the hole in the trunk and the trunk lock had been, looked like it had been punched out. And my immediate thought was, I've got a stolen car. And I'm thinking, all this craziness going on, and I find a stolen vehicle. So I get out of the car, check the plates, and I'm, I'm going around the car intentionally. I'm hoping that somebody sees me, and I'm looking at the car. I want somebody to come out. I want to know why this car has holes in the trunks. Because it, it, you got a hole in the trunk and those older cars, you can push down the back seat, get up in the front seat and you steal the car. And that's what I was thinking. Um, but when I checked the plate, it didn't come back stolen. When I looked at the steering column, I didn't see any problems, you know, like wires hanging, anything like that. It was junky. I mean, there were clothes, there were fast food bags and cups and just uh, there was, it looked like somebody was living out of the car but it wasn't stolen. So, so you moved on? I moved on. When um, you know now that that was their car. Yeah, when I found out, when, when the investigator showed me that picture and found out that that was their car, I, I, I felt sick. Um, I, I, I felt sick. I, I mean, I know that I didn't have any other legal grounds to move on. But I could have, I could have gone to the front desk and said, hey, who does, you know, which room does this car belong to? Gone to the room, hey, is, you know, what's up with your car? But it, it came back as not being stolen. So 
I moved on. And yet it was really tough for anybody to move on with their lives and, and go on as normal, knowing that these killers were crisscrossing the region, shooting people randomly as they went about their business. The fear we all felt, I know for everybody, it was really oh, intense. It was relentless and it was widespread. And it certainly wasn't helped when you heard this warning read aloud by Chief Moose. Your children are not safe anywhere at any time. The message from the sniper took a sinister turn, swiftly pulling the veil of safety from schools and parents. Time I'm waiting to see what the county is going to do about school, and um, if need be, I'll need to stay home. What can't you do these days? Go outside mm -hmm. and play soccer. And now that that chilling message was broadcast loud and clear, you know, a lot of people are wishing, quite frankly, they hadn't heard it. That was more of my reporting from 20 years ago. And yes, there was talk of canceling Halloween if the snipers weren't caught. The search for the sniper making international news headlines around the world focus on the killings and the warning for our children. And we started hearing from public figures expressing concern about the killing spree. NBA superstar Michael Jordan was living in D.C. and playing for the Washington Wizards at the time. Here he was speaking at a preseason game in Detroit. We watch the news every minute we can just to try to gather information just like anybody else, but it's just travesty, obviously, and you know we hope that things can get settled very, very quickly. I mean, we got enough people living in fear, and uh, you know, to some degree, we, we all live in fear. You know, so we got to go back to D.C., and a lot of guys got to go back to the same, you know, Montgomery County and everywhere else around D.C., and you know, got family there, and uh, I think it's a very scary moment for everybody. The White House was well aware of what was going on. Here was then President George W. Bush. There is a ruthless person on the loose. I've ordered the full resources of the federal government to help local law enforcement officials in their, in their efforts to capture this person. It was a frightening time, a puzzling case for those local law enforcement officials. When you looked at the victims in the case, there was no pattern to it. There were children, there were senior citizens, there were black, white, Hispanic, men, women. Literally, it ran the gamut of, of, of people that lived in this very diverse community, and everyone seemed to be a target. And people were terrified for themselves, but they were particularly terrified for their children. And it, it affected, for the kids that were in high school that year, or in school, any school, all school activities in this community got suspended for at least a month, basically, where we, did, we didn't have track meets, we didn't have cross-country meets, uh, we didn't have outdoor football games. Every life as it normally existed in the Washington area was put on hold for 23 days. It hit me in a way that no other random crime incidents ever had. Like, I don't know why I was so scared, but I was. It just seemed so random. Julie Saker Schlegel was living in D.C. at the time and says she vividly recalls the fear she felt. I distinctly remember seeing on one of the news broadcasts at some point back then, one of the police said, you know, we're suggesting that when you're walking like from the metro to your apartment or the grocery store or whatever, don't walk in a straight line. So that makes you a predictable, easy to hit target. Zigzag back and forth so that you're left. I'm like, this is the best advice you can give me is to walk in a zigzag. Like, that's terrifying to me. Julie says she remembers thinking if she was shot dead, nobody would know who she is. So she took a business card, put her parents' phone number on the back, and stuck it in her wallet. I found it. I still have it. It's still in my wallet to this day. I'm not quite sure why. But, like, this was my business card. And on the back, I've covered it with their phone numbers because the number's still valid. But, like, in case of emergency, contact my parents. Like, it was a very weird experience. Julie now lives in New Jersey. We spoke to her via Zoom. When I saw the, the title of your podcast, I was shocked because three weeks, it didn't feel like three weeks to me. It felt like months. I was never anywhere near any of the shootings. I never witnessed anything. I never knew any of the victims. But I mean, it felt like it could be you next. And that was the worst part. Our colleague Mike Thomas, a meteorologist and grown adult now, was 12 years old at the time. He was in school in Wheaton, Maryland, not far from the first day's murder scenes, and he recalls how freaked out the parents were. 
what I vividly remember uh, was that actual weekend. So after there were, I think, four or five on the first day, there was one on the second day, and then it was quiet during the weekend. But I had a soccer game on that Saturday, and that was at the uh, Gardens Ice House. They have all these soccer fields out there. And um, I went out with my, with my family, and we were playing uh, soccer. I was a goalie at the time, and some guy had decided to go out and there's woods next to Fairland and, and he was out there training his hunting dog and he was firing off blanks in the air and at that point there was so much paranoia over you know they had connected the bullets and these are connected um, so there was so much paranoia that when they heard the shots uh, uh, one of the parents who was uh, I believe a police officer came running out tackled his son and started just screaming like everybody get down everybody get down and my parents came my dad came running over to me put me on the ground and we all had the stay on the ground until the police got there and they just kind of swarmed and found the guy and they were like what are you doing <laughs> um so that that i vividly remember because it was that one moment of panic and you heard from our photographer nelson jones earlier in this episode you know he was also a parent raising a six-year-old daughter at the time he says he'll never forget parking his car near a strip mall to get her hair done in mclean virginia and facing the wrong way on my side of the street about 40 feet in front of me is a box truck and there I am with my daughter in the car, and I just, you know, thought right away, okay, I, gotta, I can't be upset or I can't panic. So I remember, I remember this like it was last week. I said, hey, I said, honey, we're going to play this game. We're going to try to get into the hair cutter replace as fast as we can. I'm going to come over and unbuckle you, and we're going to run in there. So she's like, okay. <laughs> so that's what we did, and I got inside that hair cutter. Is like, I mean, it was like that. It was incredible. And you know, this is just a common memory that we're hearing as so many people actually comment on our Facebook posts, our social media posts, they all kind of remember those moments when they were trying to just dodge whatever they could do. Gassing up a car, going into a store, coming out of a restaurant. And I think the thing that was just the most unsettling about it was you would do these things or you choose not to do certain things for some reason in your mind thinking that might protect you or keep you safe and then only to turn on the news and find out again that another person who was trying to be safe as well ended up being the next random victim you know and uh those of us in the media you know we couldn't stay home right we were out there reporting on this and and i have to be honest with you and maybe you felt this way too it was very a nerve-wracking time i think for all of us oh, out yeah. there and our families would wonder, are you going to be okay? Do you have to go out there? Yes, this is my job. And I have to be honest with you. So I've reported from war zones and you are issued a helmet and a flak jacket um, to protect you. Sure. We didn't have those things. We were just out there. And then if you're reporting in the evening, it's dark. The lights are on. You're literally thinking I'm lit up like a giant target. And even at police headquarters, as those uh, the number of media began to grow. I mean, I think the numbers of press passes that they finally gave out were somewhere in the 700s or something. Oh, it we was, filled an entire parking lot there. It was there. crazy. And, and then we realized that they had to put in extra security for us too. And with so many people here, security has gotten tighter. Uh, now perimeter fencing has gone up around the police station and uh, the officers are checking cars coming in and out. Well, Melanie, let me ask you this, since you're talking about the media anyway, are you guys feeling any safer now since they've established that perimeter and you're less out in the open as you do these reports hour after hour? Uh, I, yeah, you could say that. I mean, it is certainly reassuring. Uh, as, as much as it is reassuring to community members and to school members to see police uh, out on their streets and out in front of their schools, sure, we're feeling a little bit reassured here too. Just looking at that, if, if you were able to see this, you, you seem so calm there. You almost had a, a grin on your face, even though you were in the middle of what was potentially a target zone. Yeah, I think, you know, you've been in tough situations too. We all were in tough situations then, and sometimes you just, you. I hate to say you get used to it, but it becomes your day to day and you just do what you got to do. And at the moment you're focusing on your job, which is to report what's going on and you kind of lose a little bit of that personal s side of it that I'm a person standing here and maybe, you know, I've potentially often, a target. I've often said that one of the most valuable skills in this job is the ability to com compartmentalize. I don't know if it's a healthy skill but it's a valuable skill. It's a survival mechanism, yeah, really. Yeah. And yes, even police investigators, the people we were relying on to capture the killers, were unsettled by the nature of this case. Here again is retired ATF agent Mike Bouchard. My biggest fear was 
they were going to shoot one of us during a press conference. And that, we were deathly afraid of that, um, standing out there. And we had snipers perched, um, buildings nearby, you know, watching out because we did think it would better to take one of us out on camera. Very interesting to hear a, you know, grown up federal law enforcement official admit about being afraid of, of potentially getting killed in this whole scenario, yeah. which it was a stressful time. It was a crazy case for anybody who was living in the area, you know, whether we were working, Nelson Jones, who we heard from, our photographer, Mike Thomas, who was a boy at the time, watching yeah. people scatter on his soccer field. Um, for anybody, whatever they were doing, it was a very stressful time. And, uh, you know, we're hoping to kind of share that with everyone, kind of give you a, a sense of what that was like. For sure. That's episode six. What's coming up in our next episode? Next week, the snipers do more damage in Northern Virginia. In the third week of their murder spree, this includes the murder of an FBI analyst and a Montgomery County bus driver just getting ready to start his route for the day. We'll have their stories and more, so we do hope that you guys join us once again. You can find us on fox5dc.com, on YouTube, and all of your podcast platforms.